Hi everyone, welcome to this new session of CFL Level 2 FRA. Today we will be going over the last major reading that we have in our syllabus which is analysis of financial institutions. Now outright there is one very key thing about this reading that the name itself is saying it's only analysis of financial institutions. So, so far we looked at how a lot of financial reporting aspects worked for investments for employee compensation. But this chapter is focused squarely on the analysis side of things. So at no point do we have to know the technicalities of how the financial statements of a bank or an insurance company are made. We are only supposed to have coverage of this reading from the perspective that if you are presented with a financial statement of an insurance company or a bank, they do tend to have a few nuances, a few characteristics which make them different from any other regular company. You and I just need to have knowledge of what those elements are and what differences or what changes we will make in our analysis steps, in our analysis process to incorporate these differently created financial statements of financial institutions. Now financial institutions as a word, it includes a lot of companies. You have banks, insurance companies, housing finance companies, mutual fund companies, any other investment operation based organization that would also be a financial institution. But this chapter is squarely focused on two kinds of financial institutions. You have banks and you have insurance companies. So those are going to be our focus of this entire reading. One more thing throughout this reading. There will be some calculations that we'll be referring to. Most of those will use what we refer to as the Basel III framework, which is specific to US and a few other uh, regions. However, there is no hard and fast rule for a lot of the calculations that we'll be doing. The reason is that something as peculiar as a bank or an insurance company is often governed by regulatory authorities in each and every country. For example, in India, banks are governed by Reserve Bank of India. So while we'll cover some ratios of risky assets and how much capital is needed, the parameters for those ratios are not something you have to cram because those parameters differ from one country to another. What RBI specifies for Indian banks might be different from what Federal Reserve specifies for US banks. Same thing happens for insurance companies. Each, com each country has its own regulatory body. And that regulatory body would specify what is going to be adequate set of capital that insurance company should have, what all ratios they need to calculate. So as such throughout this chapter, we'll be discussing a lot of details, but at no point do you have to cram them with the intention that this is exactly what will be asked in the exam. In fact, in the exam that this chapter is tested, a lot of the information and how you would calculate a few ratios would be mentioned to you in the question itself. So the bulk of what we have to learn in this chapter is just interpretation part that if a particular country's bank is saying that they have a particular risk adjusted ratio of let's say 5%, our purpose is not to see how they calculated it. But the intention of this reading is that as financial analysis experts, we should be aware of how that 5% might have come about. The actual calculation of it is the headache of the bank's management and the regulatory authority or banks in that particular country. That is not our major concern. Our major concern is having a basic idea as to what that 5% would probably signify. With all of that out of the way, before we begin with our primary discussion, there is also a small discussion given in your syllabus as to why we need to focus on financial institutions. So we'll just quickly wrap that up. Financial institutions have a very unique position in our financial markets, in our entire economy, in the sense that they do the job of taking capital from the people who have it, who have excess money, who are not using that money, and then diverting that capital onto the areas where the money is needed. For example, banks, they allow you to have savings deposit or any other forms of deposit, which is allowing the people who have money but are not using it to earn some interest. And at the same time, using those deposits, banks extend loan to other people who might need money for some sort of investment. 
same thing happens for all financial institutions they sort of allow a very robust mechanism for flow of money in an economy so flowing of funds from those who have it to those who need it all the intermediaries in between can be thought of as in some sense or the other working as financial institutions so because of how important they are in an economy often if i am just analyzing a company whether i am doing a top down analysis or a bottom up analysis knowing the banking system will help me judge how robust the economic system is also at times you could just be looking at banking stocks for investments so a client comes to me he wants to make investment in financial sector only because he thinks the government policies over there are good so in that case i am analyzing just banking companies so i need to be aware of those so you have both dynamics one is to look at it in a more sort of economic environment situation and the other is to look at banking stocks in isolation that we cannot just analyze banking stocks by using the same ratios of return on equity or current ratios to analyze their operational efficiency we have to make some changes because banks don't operate like normal companies banks operate with the intention of facilitating flow of money in the economy so with all of that out of the way we have two major components to discuss how we deal with banks and how we deal with insurance companies let's start with the first one which is discussion of banks so out of the two financial institutions namely the banks and insurance companies which are going to be the prime focus of our syllabus let's start with banks and for banks specifically your syllabus is stressing on one particular sort of process or analysis uh, parameter that we use which is called the camels approach so capital adequacy asset quality management earnings liquidity and sensitivity this is basically just a grouping together of core focus points that will help us judge whether a bank is performing good or are they struggling in terms of their operations let's look at each of these components individually one by one starting with capital adequacy capital adequacy is basically trying to tell us does the bank have enough capital with them or not because normally banks give out a lot of loans if those loans have some sort of default then banks still owe money to the people who deposited money so for example i have a savings account in a bank i deposit the money bank then uses some portion of that money to give out loan to someone who is in need of money if that person defaults bank still owes me the money that i have deposited so to fulfill that sort of gap that can arise banks need to have an adequate amount of capital capital of banks doesn't work exactly the same way as capital for any normal company would we've discussed capital at level 1 corporate finance and at level 2 also that it comprises a combination of preference equity debt in case of banks that is not going to be the case so for banks capital has its own sort of definition its own terminology capital for a bank is divided into three categories the first category is called common equity tier 1 capital common equity tier 1 capital includes your common equity and retained earnings along with other comprehensive income adjusted for deferred tax in case deferred tax is existing for a company and it also includes any other additional paid in capital basically sometimes it happens that the book value of the shares is 10 dollars but they are issued at a higher value so that extra value that you get over the book value that is also part of common equity tier 1 capital then you have other tier 1 capital other tier 1 capital basically includes all other kind of instruments which have no fixed maturity which means there is no sort of redemption date specified for these instruments there is no fixed maturity for these instruments and also they don't have any contractual obligation which means there is no obligation on the company to mandatorily make 
payments to these securities. One of the common examples could be preferential shares with the discretionary dividends. So preference shares without any maturity date and where dividends are also discretionary in nature, which means the company can decide whether those dividends are to be distributed or not. The contractual obligation ones are called cumulative preference shares where dividend if not paid one year, it accumulates to the next year. So that would be an instrument with some sort of contractual obligation, but other tier one capital only includes instruments which have no maturity and no specified contractual obligation. Aside from these, you have tier two capital. Tier two capital includes other kind of instruments which have original maturities of more than five years. So when they were issued, if they were issued for more than five years, all of those are included over here. Any sort of security, any sort of instrument for raising capital that the banks use, which has a time duration of less than five years, is not part of any of these three and hence is not considered part of the capital of the bank. So any sort of short term instrument that they are using to raise money, that is considered to be part of their operations, not related to their capital. So three categories in which the capital of a bank is divided. Now, throughout the syllabus, we will keep referring to what is called the Basel III framework, which is basically a sort of a reference point for the syllabus. It's not the hard and fast rule that only that is the framework applicable. In the real world, what capital is going to be included in these categories or some countries might even have different names for these categories. All of that depends on the policies of central bank. So in the real world, you'll find differences from one country to another. Our definitions are sort of more generalized and based on a reference point of basis three framework. That framework also says one more thing. It says that common equity tier one capital should be at least 4.5% of risk weighted assets. Keep in mind this 4.5 is at least, which means banks should have at least this much capital. The combination of first two categories is called tier one capital. And the framework recommends this tier one capital should be at least 6% of risk weighted assets. And then total capital, which means tier one plus tier two, this should be at least 8% of risk weighted assets. Now over here, the new term that we are introduced to is risk weighted assets. What exactly are those? Well, unlike a normal business, for a normal business, machine, land and building, all of these are assets. But when we talk about banks, banks have something unique in that sense that for banks, the assets are loans. So let's say you have a bank that has following assets. They have cash. Cash also includes deposits with central banks. So often banks have some money deposited with central banks. They might even borrow some money from central banks at times. Both of those will affect the assets and liabilities of the bank. So cash plus deposits with central bank. The other kind of asset is normally loans. So they have loans. Loans can be of different types. Commercial loan. Personal loan or housing loan. So this sort of represents what the assets of a bank could look like. Now each country can specify or normally central bank of each country specifies based on the situation in that country, what should be the risky nature of all of these deposits, all of these assets. So you have something known as risk weights. This is not even specified in the Basel III framework outright. So this is something that the question will give you directly. So if you ever have to calculate anything, risk weights will be given to you. And normally risk weights for cash are 0% because bank thinks that if they already have cash, there is no chance of losing that cash. The cash is sitting with the bank itself. So cash and deposits with central bank are considered to be risk free in their entirety. So we take this as 0%. The central bank can specify other limits also. So let's say they are saying 50% 
risk weightage for commercial loans 100 percent for personal loans and let's say 200 percent for housing loans and let's say the value of the asset is 200 million 500 million 100 million and 200 million all we have to do to estimate risk weighted assets is to multiply the risk weights with the assets so risk weighted asset is simply giving us an idea that how many assets or how much worth the assets of the bank are considered risky in nature so using these risk weights and assets this becomes zero if i multiply 50 percent with 500 this is 250 then these values would be 100 and this would come out as 400. This is just to give you a reference that for some situations we can even have a risky portion or risk weight of more than 100% for certain kind of loans. The reason why that might happen is maybe because of the legal structure in the country where it is a non-recourse loan or it restricts the bank's right for some kind of foreclosure. So in all of those situations, you could have a higher risk weight specified as well. The only purpose of writing this is to make you guys aware that central banks can also specify this rate to be higher than 100% at times. If I add all of these up, this gets me 750. This says that if the total assets were 1000, around assets of $750 million worth are considered risky for me. And this risky asset is what I want to cover with my capital. So when we look at the capital along with these terms now, common equity tier one capital should be at least 4.5% of this 750. This simply means that by way of common equity, retained earnings, additional capital, all of these things, I should be able to cover at least 4.5% of my risk weighted assets. So that in case something really bad happens in the economy, the bank does not immediately falter. They need to have some capital that they can use to bring stability back. So these are the minimum requirements. So this is sort of the outlook. And if you get calculations based on this, one sort of calculation is the calculating risk weighted asset itself. The second calculation would be that they'll give you some values for these capitals. You just have to specify on the basis of these percentages, whether the capital is adequate or not. So all of these 4.5%, 6% and 8%, these are minimum values. More than that is good. Anything less than that means that the bank's operations or bank runs at a very high risk of failing to operate in case the risky assets have their risk materialized. So I hope all of that discussion about capital adequacy is clear. Let's move on to the next portion, which is asset quality.